Hello, uh, you've tuned in to Academia SG's uh, Singapore Studies Junior Scholar Seminars. Uh, I'm Cherry and George at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of my fellow editors, uh, as well as the co-conveners of this event, the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, our series aims to serve as a nurturing venue for PhD students and postdoctoral scholars uh, to present their research on Singapore to a multidisciplinary and international audience. Uh, today it's the turn of Joshua Babcock, a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Chicago, uh, whose research examines the politics of race, language, and belonging in Singapore. Uh, we're delighted to have with us also Dr. Wu Yen Yen, who's probably best known for her award-winning 2006 film, uh, Singapore Dreaming, but whom we've invited to respond to Josh's presentation as an expert in multicultural pedagogy. Uh, we hope that members of the audience, especially the many students out there, uh, will chip in with your own questions and comments uh, via the chat window in the first instance. Uh, but first, whether you're having your morning coffee uh, in this time zone or waiting for dinner like Josh in North America, let's sit back and learn from today's speaker, Joshua Babcock. Right, thank you, Cherian. Hello, everyone. My name is Josh Babcock, and I am a PhD candidate in linguistic anthropology at the University of Chicago. I would like to begin today by thanking the Academia SG editors for the opportunity to be part of the Singapore Studies Junior Scholar Seminar Series, and also to Cherry and George and Corey Tan for all of the support leading up to today. Uh, I would also like to thank Wu Yan Yan for agreeing to act as my respondent and to the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at Singapore University of Technology and Design for co-sponsoring the talk. Belinda Yuan and Harvey Nyo at the center have been incredible partners in helping to promote this event. So before I get into the lecture itself, I am legally obligated to mention my sponsors. Uh, this research was funded in part by the Fulbright Program of the US State Department, the Ruth Landis Memorial Research Fund of the Reed Foundation, and the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation and Committee on Southern Asian Studies at the University of Chicago. I am also grateful to the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities for hosting me during my primary research term from 2018 to 2020, and in particular to the center's chair, Chan Heng Chi, for making my research term at the center possible. And last but not least, I would like to thank all of you in the virtual audience who joined on a Wednesday morning to attend this talk from Singapore and other parts of Asia, and also to anyone tuning in this evening from Chicago or other parts of the US. So without any further ado, I will share my screen and we'll get started. All right, we'll begin by going back to National Day 2020. Media outlets in and around Singapore were releasing their obligatory National Day messages. Produced by both state and non-state media, many of the messages filling my Facebook feed that week involved typical themes about unity, pride, racial harmony, and multiculturalism. Unsurprisingly, given the pandemic, many of them also focused on themes of connection in the face of social distancing and resilience in the face of the ongoing pandemic. Yet some of them took a different approach, focusing on societal change and looking toward the future by showcasing the unexpected stories of some Singaporeans in the present. My talk today focuses on two videos that circulated broadly last year. I focus on these not because of their subject matter and narrative structures alone, but also because of the ways that they circulated online and offline. The first video that I consider here, which many of you might have seen, particularly in Singapore, was titled, These Afro Kids Are More Singaporean Than You. It was released two days before National Day on 7th August, 2020. In addition to garnering hundreds of online comments that day, the video link was also forwarded to me in a couple of anti-WhatsApp groups that I belong to. Uh, don't ask me why, or maybe do during the q and I'm happy to tell you more. The virtual conversation that followed in the WhatsApp group was mostly consistent of expressions of surprise. Things like, 
quote, I never knew there were African Singaporeans, not people from America, Singaporeans with African heritage. Another group member replied with, quote, wow, they speak Chinese better than me, so Singaporean. Later came yet another reply, quote, today there are so many foreigners like them. They look totally foreign, but sound like us. A couple days later, on 9th August, a second video was released, again generating a great deal of online buzz. Titled, What Makes a Singaporean, the video was paired with a photo essay and human interest journalistic piece published by Rice Media, which was titled, The Class of 2050, Imagining a More Diverse and Inclusive Singapore. Among the hundreds of comments posted to both of these videos in the days that followed their release, in addition to generic National Day greetings, many commentators discussed and debated the featured individuals' races and migration trajectories. Yet even though these videos celebrated these Afro kids to be quote unquote more Singaporean than you and framed the young mixed race individuals as the future faces of Singapore, these individuals' status remained marked as the video's entertainment value was constructed as a function of the viewer's disconnect between what they see and what they hear. In this lecture today, I consider the questions, what does a Singaporean sound like? What do they look like? Who gets to decide and according to what strategies do these decisions get made? To be clear, I don't think these answers, sorry, these questions have a single answer since a Singaporean can look or sound like anything. And this is to say nothing of the dramatic social and linguistic changes that have taken place both before and since Singapore's independence, which have produced dramatic changes in Singaporeans' typical linguistic profiles in less than three generations. Instead, my point in framing the questions in this way and using these videos and online commentary as a case study is because there are still strong normative ideas held by many individuals and groups in Singapore about who is assumed to belong to the nation and who is not. Being Singaporean, that is being born in Singapore and holding a pink IC, is neither necessary nor sufficient for being able to perform one's belonging. Belonging requires additional evidence from language and appearance, neither of which are self-evident facts, but which rest on acts of evaluation and verification by socially powerful others. And this is the general argument of the presentation that I'm giving to all of you today. So media like these and the commentaries alongside them stage this tension clearly. On the one hand, there are critics who critique the generalized situation of racialized majoritarian privilege in Singapore, sometimes called Chinese privilege. And these critics have worked to contest the naturalized and often invisible links between Chinese-ness and Singaporeans. And yet, individuals like the ones who appear in these videos find themselves in an ambiguous and frequently contested position, as others assume, based on their appearance, that they are foreign. In order to challenge these assumptions, their strategy often consists of asserting their belonging in Singapore by positioning themselves with respect to a Chinese Singaporean default and performing this through Mandarin and Singlish, whether by critiquing this default or by assuming it. The rest of my presentation will elaborate this across four parts. So before I continue with the presentation proper, I will take a moment to situate this lecture and the material here in the context of my broader dissertation research. After this, I return to the two videos one at a time to analyze the relevant narrative strategies that get used in each. In the final section, I then discuss key themes in the online commentary where commentators use various strategies to construct and debate the categories of good versus bad migrants and the bounds of the idea of what they call the true blue Singaporean. All right, so as I said, before I continue the lecture, I'd like to take a moment to share how this material fits into my broader research. My dissertation is titled Image and the Total Utopia, Scaling Racio-Linguistic Belonging in Singapore. It's based on a total of 24 months of ethnographic fieldwork research conducted between 2016 and 2020. My overall argument in the thesis is that ongoing questions in Singapore about what Singapore and Singaporeanness are or can be, which I call the image of Singapore, are based on a fundamental set of contrasts that get deployed at a range of sites and scales. Contrasts between things like local and global, local and foreign, east and west, third world and first, as well as within or among racialized groups in Singapore. 
These contrasts are not self-evident, rather are an effect of strategies that different individuals can use in different contexts with different degrees of success. Together, these tensions and strategies structure the possibility for belonging. And for answering questions about who, that is, what social positions can make claims about what the image of Singapore is, about who can claim to legitimately belong to the nation and who cannot. In other words, I pay attention to how people perform contestations and contrasts. As I consider it in my dissertation, the image of Singapore isn't a thing, it's a relation. Another way to say this is Singapore is a place, but it's also an idea. And it's not just one idea, it's many, hence contestation. Further, the image of Singapore isn't absolute or unchanging. It's always an image for someone, for some audience, in some situation, and produced in contrast to its various opposites. For instance, Singapore is a nation state in a world of other nation states. Singapore is not China, and it's not America. But of course, these differences aren't always equally relevant. Even though their relevance depends on context, there are still observable regularities in the ways that people make arguments about what their idea of Singapore is. So in other words, even though each situation is unique, strictly speaking, the things that people do and the arguments they make fit observable patterns. As my dissertation title suggests, I frame my research according to what the linguistic anthropologist Jonathan Rosa and education scholar Nelson Flores have called a raciolinguistic perspective. This pays attention to the historical and present co-naturalization of language and race. So to elaborate on that a bit, as Rosa and Flores argue, race and language cannot be considered as obviously or naturally separate. Rather, a raciolinguistic perspective is one that tracks how linguistic and racial forms are jointly constructed or constructed together as sets and rendered mutually rec recognizable as named languages or variety and racial, uh, and racial categories and doing so in ways that change historically, institutionally, and socially. So I'm sharing all of this because instead of looking for an essence or quality that is the image of Singapore, my research is about what linguistic anthropologists would call discourse strategies. Discourse strategies are the things that individuals do using both language and other forms in order to try to create their desired outcomes in interactions. And this works by recruiting co-participants to respond using a relatively finite set of available options. So in the context of the videos that I will discuss later, the individuals who are featured in the videos use a range of strategies that include things like speaking Singlish, Mandarin, and English, and which also include making arguments about why and how they are Singaporean, together with implicitly performing their own belonging without describing it explicitly. In response to this, others deploy strategies for accepting or contesting those claims, mostly in online comment threads, but also elsewhere. So again, to be clear, my research isn't about what all Singaporeans believe, think, or do, or even about what a specific group of Singaporeans believe, think, or do. It's about understanding the strategies that people use in different situations to make claims about their idea of Singapore, and how those strategies shift based on the identities of the participants and features of the situation. I will now turn back to the main subject matter of my lecture. The first video that I'm going to consider today, titled These Afro Kids Are More Singaporean Than You, is seven minutes and 10 seconds long. It was released online and circulated largely via social media platforms. In the video, three, uh, three siblings with Black Zimbabwean ancestry are interviewed about their experiences living and coming of age in Singapore. Although this is framed as an uplifting National Day message about Singaporeanness being the overcoming of differences across race, migration, and language, the video can be read as a subtle but powerful critique of the exclusions that are produced through strategies that focus on narrow normative ideas about what a Singaporean can look or sound like. The siblings in the video themselves can be seen to implicitly collapse the image of Singapore into a racialized Chinese-ness and the ability to speak Mandarin in that they often implicitly align being Singaporean with being Chinese and speaking Mandarin. And yet they also narrate ways in which Black Mandarin-speaking subjects like them are presumed by others to be not Singaporean by virtue of their marked racial personhood. So this becomes particularly clear in the video's opening sequence, which is 23 seconds long and which I will quickly play here. I think it is important to keep the culture alive. I, I agree. I think it's really yeah, important. Yeah, totally. Because we know we are Africans. 
Yeah. So we have to keep the culture alive. But then oh, we're still Singaporeans lah. So yeah. Why? 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 I think it is in Right, so as we saw, this video opens with the three siblings, Nancy, Alvin, and Wendy, seated together on a sofa in what is most likely their parents' HDB flat. The clip comprises three segments. First, with Alvin, the youngest sibling, speaking in a phonologically and prosodically Zimbabwean African English. This is a, a way that linguists describe what other people would call an accent. This is accompanied by an African drums soundtrack. And yet as the sentence ends, he switches suddenly into Singlish for the second segment. After this, we see a jump cut where Nancy is speaking Mandarin through a sentence that is translated as, uh, when we speak a bit of Mandarin, and here she provides a really strong verbal emphasis on saying just a bit, yi dian de hua yi. Here, Alvin and his siblings then begin imitating ordering dishes at a Taifan mixed rice stall by pointing, saying, jaga, jaga, haga, um, which even for people who don't speak Mandarin or don't speak it well, should come across as relatively basic. And of course, the siblings follow this with a comically exaggerated, wow, their Mandarin is so good in a sing-song voice. This introductory segment signals both the viewer's anticipated expectations and the surprise that they're likely to experience on seeing these siblings speaking in this way, but it also critiques those expectations as well, as the siblings mock the disconnect between their basic Mandarin use and others' reactions to it. Although being Singaporean gets discussed extensively throughout the video, the video's final segment begins with a title card that, is, that reads, let's talk about being Singaporean. During this segment, Alvin offers the following narrative, which I will play here. Singapore is awesome. I never really found it as uh, a place, place that I didn't fit in. It's been a place that's always been like, uh, somehow, even though like me being born here, I mean, because I'm, I'm the one who was born here amongst them. <laughs> so. I would genuinely, genuinely forget that I'm not even African sometimes. Like, I'll be my friends, like, normal, chilling and stuff, and then, like, sometimes just all be going to buy food, and then we'll be like, Auntie, Auntie, you want to sound quite fun? Oh, you can talk Oh, yeah. Not that. that kind of moment. Like, you have that kind of, like, snap. So, for us, we still always felt so included. Like, it's not, yeah. we never felt like uh, that foreign kid in class kind of thing, but we always kind of felt like we were just part of Singapore, we're just all Singaporeans. We just look different. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Singapore's awesome. All right. For those who may not have been able to fully see what was going on in that clip, it began with Alvin talking about how he always felt that Singapore was a place that he truly fit in, and describes this as forgetting that he's African sometimes. He goes on to describe a situation where he is sitting in a place like a hawker center, chilling and getting food with his friends. He speaks Mandarin to the chicken rice auntie, who then reacts in surprise. At this moment, he says, oh yeah, I'm not Singaporean. I forgot that. In these kinds of moments, like you have that kind of snap. Across the narration that occurred in this video, Alvin outlines a series of contrasting positions between places where he does and does not fit in, between being African versus being Singaporean, and between the siblings versus that foreign kid at school. Crucially here, the closing utterance reasserts the fact that he and his siblings attributed non-belonging begins with an act of seeing. So in spite of loving Singapore and being Singaporean by citizenship, and despite being socially included and feeling as if they fit in, they nevertheless look different from a prototypical Singaporean. For Alvin, speaking Singaporean accented Mandarin gets treated here as if it should be an immediate sign to interlocutors that he is Singaporean. And yet the perceived strangeness of his ability to speak Mandarin, a strangeness that is ascribed to his Black or African identity, is here narrated as a moment at which he feels not that he isn't Chinese, which was never in question, but instead that he was not Singaporean. I will now move on to the second video. And here, the perceived gap between appearance and language use also structures the narrative arc of the film. So released on National Day itself, 9th August 2020, 
The video, What Makes Us Singaporean, is extremely short, just three minutes and 15 seconds long. As the title suggests, in the video, 16 mixed-race individuals answer the question, what makes us Singaporean? The video, as I said before, was accompanied by a written text titled The Class of 2050, imagining a more diverse and inclusive Singapore. And in this piece, the same individuals who are shown in this film narrate their experiences of exclusion, often due to the fact that they are racially misidentified and misidentified as foreign. So while the written text labels the individual's racial mix, the video does not. But as I said before, the video still implicitly plays with the perceived mismatch between how one looks and how one speaks. I'm going to now quickly play the first two minutes of that video, or the first one minute, sorry. I feel like I'm very like, like half Alien, half Mina, you know? So a lot of people, they think that I'm Malay, or if I speak like how I'm speaking now, which is incredibly Chinese, then they'll probably think I'm Chinese. It's pretty much the only way people can identify that I'm Singaporean at this point. So that's what makes me Singaporean. So my mother tongue was actually Mandarin, and sometimes when I speak Mandarin, I actually really sound like not how I look. I think that might be the most Singaporean thing about me. I'm super kiasu and I'm a kanchong spider. Always wanting to do things quickly. I don't know say how to say it. Mm. Singlish lah is in our blood. It's easier, it's quicker, you know? Complete sentence faster. Can? Can? Can. <laughs> what is the most Singaporean thing about me? Um, I mean, I guess the fact that I could code switch. <laughs> uh, Auntie, uh, can I have uh, one chicken rice? Okay. Uh, tapao. Alright. <laughs> Right, so in this video, there are a total of 16 distinct individuals who appear, but three of them receive the largest amount of collective airtime. Like so these are the individual identified in the written text as Chinese and Black who have labeled speaker one. Second, an individual identified as Chinese and Indian who I've labeled as speaker two. And third, an individual identified as Filipino who I, whom I've labeled as speaker five. And this is just to indicate their appearance throughout the, the order of their appearance in the video. I'm going to quickly play two of these shorter segments again before I describe them in further detail. A lot of people, they think that I'm Malay, or if I speak like how I'm speaking now, which is incredibly Chinese, then they'll probably think I'm Chinese. It's pretty much the only way people can identify that I'm Singaporean at this point. So that's what makes me Singaporean. So my mother tongue was actually Mandarin, and sometimes when I speak Mandarin, I actually really sound like not how I look. I think that might be the most Singaporean thing about me. So here in this uh, first short clip, speaker one describes their racialized appearance in terms of how it comes together with or challenges default understandings of her language use. So as you just saw, speaker one describes her speech as incredibly Chinese, which again is a description of what linguists would call the prosody, phonology and pacing or what other people might refer to as accent rather than to lexical features or code choice, meaning the words that she uses or the language that she speaks, since we don't actually see her speak Mandarin in this video. Speaker two, who does not appear speak, uh, who does appear, sorry, speaking Mandarin, also narrates a disjuncture between how they look and how they sound. As with speaker one, speaker two describes the gap between her appearance and her linguistic ability as, quote, the only way that people can identify I am Singaporean, end quote. I'm going to now play a short clip from speaker five. What's the most Singaporean thing about me? Um, I mean, I guess the fact that I could code switch. <laughs> uh, Auntie, uh, can I have uh, one chicken rice? Okay, uh, tapao. All right. So speaker five in this clip, who is self-described as Filipino, characterizes her ability to code switch as the most Singaporean thing about her, even though she doesn't overtly describe the variety she switches into as being Singlish. This is still obvious both due to the segments framing alongside other segments in the video. So the fact that speakers immediately previous to her had been talking about Singlish overtly, but this is also through the contrast accomplished through her speech patterns and explicit labeling. So she called it code switching before she did the switch as a way to signal what she was about to do before she did it.
So as should be clear, these videos themselves reveal a number of perspectives, not only from the interviewees, but also due to the influence of things like directors, editors, interviewers, camera crews, and so forth. But beyond this, the videos were interpreted in multiple ways by viewers. So I'm now going to move on to my final section where I focus on two recurrent contrasts that get made and debated by online commenters. First, a contrast between the good migrant who assimilates or integrates and the bad migrant who does not. And second, I look at a contrast between the true blue Singaporean and the Singaporean who loses themselves. I suggest that both of these point to broader anxieties about mobility and migration, both the mobility of others who come to Singapore and the mobility of Singaporeans who travel. So in total, the two videos I considered here garnered approximately 2,100 comments at the time that I began analyzing them. And most of these, approximately 1,800 comments, were posted in response to the first video, these Afro kids are more Singaporean than you. In both threads, a majority of comments consist of one of the three things. So first, tagging other Facebook users without any additional commentary. Second, posting with a short, generally one to three word reaction, so things like, wow, or love this, or didn't expect that. And the third is voicing a generic National Day message. So things like One United People Singapore or Happy National Day. I can further describe the sampling strategy I used during the Q&A if anyone is interested. But among the 1,800 comments on the video, these Afro kids are more Singaporean than you. I'm focusing on a subset of 136 comments about the siblings' language use and appearance rather than those that do things like give generic National Day messages or simply tagged up, as I mentioned before. So I'm considering comments like the following. So quote, they have completely local Singaporean accents. They love the local food. If one never heard their talking, nobody will think they're Singaporean, but African. This also includes comments like this one. Quote, I closed my eyes and said, yes, that's a Singaporean accent, all right, sweet. Comments like these explicitly stage a contrast between what is seen and what is heard. Vision here is treated as a default mode of perceiving racialized embodiment, but also national belonging. The primacy of vision is seen in both comments, though the second goes further, where confirming the authenticity of an accent gets narrated as requiring that the viewer close their eyes. Other commenters asserted these sibling status as good migrants, whether by describing them as such overtly or by implicitly contrasting them to various bad migrants. This happens in comments like the following, quote, love these kids. They genuinely feel Singaporean and blend well with locals. Good to welcome more good migrants like them, making Singapore a more welcoming, colorful, and better place. They learned from, they learned as we also learned from them. Welcome. Here, the commenter performs an act of offering a welcome, which was a strategy used extensively by other commenters as well. This negatively implicates an alternate possibility that an individual might remain unwelcome even if one is born in Singapore or lives in Singapore their whole lives. Still other commenters constructed comparisons between or among Singaporeans by passing a reference to the individuals in the videos altogether. In these comments, they describe various ways in which someone born and bred in Singapore can become less Singaporean through their behavior or values, as in the following. Quote, you guys are more Singaporean than some Singaporeans I know, who don't even know anything else beyond their own culture and race. This comment, which is addressed rhetorically toward the siblings themselves, suggests the idea that one can become less Singaporean than someone else, in this case by failing to know what lies beyond their own culture and race. In other words, by failing to live up to the dominant expectations of racial harmony and multiculturalism. I'm now going to move to the comments in the final video, what makes us Singaporean. And particularly noteworthy here was a debate over the status of what commenters referred to as the true blue Singaporean. In these debates, some commentators set a relatively low bar, but others drew very restrictive boundaries about what this category could or could not include. You can see this in the following. Quote, fundamentally, a true blue Singaporean is one who does not have the money, connection, or expertise to move to anywhere else in the world when Singapore is in a crisis. Hence, he or she has no option but to do or die here. 
I don't see how anyone who has an escape option can be any more Singaporean than that. Does that mean the poor is likely to be more Singaporean than the rich? When it comes down to basic survival, my answer is yes. Now, of course, I don't claim to know this commenter's socioeconomic status, but here we see an effort at drawing distinctions within the category of those born in Singapore or holding Singaporean citizenship. This kind of strategy takes the video itself as relatively incidental and uses the comment thread as a platform to voice other kinds of views, here narrating both the hierarchy of authenticity and also anxieties over national survival. So since I'm coming close to my time limit for today, I'll keep the conclusion brief. Just to summarize, in this lecture, I've shown how being vocal gets constructed as a function of both how one looks and speaks, but also evaluations of local and foreign status draw in a range of other distinctions as well, among cultural values, knowledge, age, socioeconomic status, migration trajectories, and more. In these videos and in the commentaries, we can see how the ability to sound local does not guarantee that one will be taken to be Singaporean, at least not durably. And further, despite widespread discourses that claim that a Singaporean can look like anything, this relatively open and inclusive strategy has to contend with strategies for construct constructing and defending a narrow vision of what a Singaporean can be. In the replies and responses among different competing strategies, the performance of belonging is both racialized and linguistic and is produced in shifting configurations. So with that, I will conclude my formal remarks here. I look forward to hearing Yin Yin's reflections on this talk and also to the questions, comments, and suggestions from all of you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Josh. And uh, let's turn straight away to uh, Yen Yen for her uh, uh, remarks and questions for Josh. Thank you, um, Academia SG, Cherian and Yen and Corey for inviting me to um, respond to Josh's excellent work. Um, I think that the support for junior scholars in this through this platform is wonderful. And um, also it's wonderful for scholars to get used to speaking to different audiences. I think that's a very important training. So Josh, first, I am very impressed by the hard work you put into data collection. Um, over, he didn't say this in his presentation, but he collected over 90 ethnographic interviews, 60 participant observations, and 394 events. That's a very impressive um, set of data. Um, so I'll first respond to this chapter as a creator of popular culture and also as a teacher. Um, this chapter evoked for me certain, you know, I kept thinking about what programming and classroom experiences I would, I would, I would create um, based on what this chapter inspired for me. So I'm imagining a game show on Channel 8. <laughs> <laughs> where the guests are all behind a curtain and the contestants hear their voices but don't see them. Hearing their voices, the contestants have to guess the age, race and nationality of the guests. And voila, the guests are revealed. There are close-ups of the contestants' surprise when the guests are revealed um, and the guests and contestants chat about what's surprising and what's unexpected. And the winner, by the way, gets two nights stay at the Resorts World Sentosa. I'm also imagining a classroom where kids hear audio tracks of different voices and they have a bunch of photographs of people and they have to match the pictures to the voices and also guess the race, class and nationality of each of the voices. And voila, the correct answers are revealed. And the kids are all surprised and they have a meaningful and deep discussion about what, why they made those choices, what surprised them about the answers and how... Um, our expectations uh, and why our expectations of what a Singaporean sounds like and looks like is important. As a cultural maker who works in visual forms, uh, this work makes me imagine an experiential exhibit at the National Museum. Um, the audience walks through an exhibit of various combinations of skin color and languages and they have to answer the following questions. Rate what you see in terms of Singaporeanness rate your level of joy as a Singaporean seeing this. So we'll have one video of uh, Nancy, Alvin and Wendy speaking in Mandarin, Singlish and, and uh, Zimbabwean accent. Um, Nancy, Alvin and Wendy speaking a Malay and Singlish and a Zimbabwean accent. 
a Chinese speaking, a Chinese person speaking Singlish and Singapore Mandarin and with a Beijing accent as well. And as the audience walks through this exhibit, they have to rate um, uh, one to five, uh, how Singaporean is this person, and they have to rate their level of joy seeing this. So the data would produce a map of Singaporeanness, and Josh would get to test his thesis about the hierarchy of Singaporeanness. As an academic, um, this work makes me want to ask uh, several questions. I think the key question I ask is, who is the audience for this work, and what do you hope to achieve with this work? In my writing over the years, I found it very much more satisfying to be quite concrete about my audience. Um, is the audience Cherian? Is the audience my grandmother? Is the audience my primary school teacher? I'm trying to, because whatever work we're doing um, in research, however objective we are, we're always trying to change somebody's mind about something. Um, and I keep asking myself, and I hope you will too, uh, what is the change you're hoping to see? Having that concrete audience in mind really shapes my writing and yields much better returns for all the work that I'm doing. And you've collected a ton of data and I think kind of having some clar um, greater clarity about the audience would be, would be, would be really wonderful. Um, it might be that teacher I'm talking about who's designing these classroom experiences. As a Singaporean, these are some of my responses. So food emerged as a strong feature in both uh, videos. Food was very strong in both videos. Um, and it's almost like it's, it's a site of performing Singaporeanness. Uh, the site of performing Singaporeanness is often the way people order food. And it came up in both videos. Is that something interesting to you as well? Is that something you want to kind of go deeper on? Um, I was struck by a comment in the chapter that you didn't mention in the presentation um, that nobody had anything bad to say about Singlish. Uh, I found that very interesting. Uh, you, you mentioned it and then you left it there. Is that something worth exploring? Um, and third question. So what are the, diff the ways of being Singaporean that were absent or not, that we, we know to be true, but are absent or not said in these kind of video settings, these kind of, video, kind of more formal settings? Um, the casuism, the materialism, the credentialism, the consumerism. So all these didn't, didn't appear as a, oh, actually somebody mentioned being kiasu, right, as, as one moment. But other than that, nobody really did talk about these things. So we, we have uh, through, and we have understood these things to be very Singaporean as well. Has being Singaporean changed or uh, over the years, or are these settings somewhat inappropriate for these other expressions? Are they obliged to perform only a certain kind of Singaporeanness? Um, and is there anything, dare I say it, uniquely Singaporean about the way that citizenship is mapped uh, or desirability is mapped in, 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 these, uh, in Singapore? How does that shape or how does this video as kind of a, a portent of the future of Singapore, how does this um, shape, how does, what does this tell us about the future of Singapore? And finally, which is your favorite chicken rice stall in Singapore. I'll stop. <laughs> so, uh, Josh, uh, many of um, Dr. Wu's comments, of course, are takeaways for you to think about. Don't feel obliged to answer all of them. I'm particularly interested in, uh, though, in hearing your responses to two of them. One, of course, is the chicken rice one. But <laughs> the, <laughs> the other one, which I think is, is a, an extremely important uh, question to bear in mind, is who's your audience? And you're not allowed to answer your dissertation committee. Right, I think <laughs> that there's more to life than <laughs> even for PhD students than satisfying their dissertation committee. So I'm quite keen in uh, hearing, like um, uh, Yen Yen, you know, uh, who you think your uh, who whose minds, as she put it, uh, are you trying to change? Yes, thank you. First of all, Yen Yen, for all of these really incredible comments. Um, these are very helpful for thinking about not only what I want to do with this particular chapter, uh, but also how I need to situate it in the context of the other chapters that I've also been writing and, and developing eventually to publish as a book um, whenever that happens down the road. 
Um, I did very quickly just want to mention the. I was very excited when you talked about classroom experiences because I did use both of these videos when I was teaching a course on um, critical approaches to hybridity during the fall term that just passed. Uh, but that was obviously a very different context because it was predominantly American students in the classroom, uh, though there were a couple of Singaporeans who had a lot to say about this that I think were very enriching for the experiences of everyone else in the room. Um, in terms of the question of the audience for this, yes, the sort of immediate audience is my dissertation committee, but they're not my ultimate or even my most um, my most interesting audience, dare I say. Um, and that's no criticism toward anyone on my committee individually. Um, I think ultimately I am interested primarily in questions of pedagogy. And in part, that's why I think you have been maybe one of uh, a small number of ideal respondents to this work. Um, just because I'm thinking in terms not only of pedagogy at the college level and sort of elite pedagogies in American universities or Singaporean universities, um, but also thinking about how this research can inform precisely the kinds of interventions that you have described in terms of experiences that force students to confront their own biases. And I, I definitely don't have um, any illusions that this can lead to immediate large scale social change. But I think classrooms are a really key site for at least uh, helping students and future members of society to imagine alternatives beyond the present. Um, and this is sort of one of the things that I have been thinking about as I go about my research, just because uh, so much of the material that I have gathered does deal with the sort of taken for granted assumptions about different connections between language and race, between language, race and identity, between language, race, identity and nationality and so forth. Um, so I think that would be how I would want to answer that, uh, that question in particular. Um, the question of chicken rice is so tricky um, because you know there there's a whole politics to to food in Singapore, as you mentioned. Um, I will say some of my favorite. I, I don't have one favorite. I think my favorite for um, I have spent a lot of time going to the um, it's called Five Star Kampong Chicken Rice in East Coast Road. And what I really like about them is that they have the um, steamed kampong chicken and the rice is very nice, very fragrant. Um, their chili is my second favorite. So I think the best chili that I have personally tried was at uh, McKenzie Rex Chicken Rice on Changi Road. Um, these are just my personal opinions. I'm sure others have excellent recommendations and I really but look forward to hearing all of those. Uh, thanks, Josh. You know, uh, people say that um, in the politics of uh, Singapore, as well as many other countries, race, language, and religion are the third rail, right? Academics have to be so careful about claims they make. In Singapore, of course, uh, favorite chicken rice has to be added to that third rail too. So uh, congratulate your braveness in actually sticking your neck out and uh, uh, offering an answer. <laughs> uh, we of course welcome uh, questions via the uh, Zoom chat uh, and Corey is keeping an eye on questions via Facebook Live and YouTube Live as well. Uh, we'll try and uh, uh, insert them as they come. Uh, while waiting, let me uh, use this uh, opportunity to uh, to uh, probe you on, on something that I'm curious about. Uh, well, first of all, though, you know, I have to say that as uh, someone who's been away from Singapore for 14 months, which is the longest time I've been away from Singapore in my entire adult life, um, I'm going to again risk um, angering the foodies out there and saying that, uh, in fact, your, your presentation makes me realize that the thing that I miss even more than Singapore food is English which is my, uh, which I, I realize it's in fact my native language, right? And I have to code switch like one of those uh, interviews mentioned from Singlish to proper English like we're using now. Um, but my question is this, uh, you know, you've uh, stated, I think absolutely correctly that, that uh, racial linguistic uh, belonging is structured through contrast inevitably. Uh, we define ourselves in reference to the other. Um, and I think it's a lot, uh, seems to hinge on whether we're able 
uh, to get the best of both worlds? You know, are we able to find community in these uh, uh, self definitions? And there is, of course, a certain warmth and uh, and sense of belonging that comes to, for example, hearing Singlish on the street and so on. Right? Are we able to to um, uh, tap into that, but not in an in an exclusive way? Uh, do you think it is possible to have the best of uh, uh, both worlds, where we find uh, comfort and belonging in what we sound like, for example, uh, and yet uh, also have this uh, cosmopolitan mindset that readily, uh, you know, accepts as Singaporean those who don't quite sound or look like us. Is that balance possible? Thanks for this question. I, the optimist in me would like to say yes. I would hope that this balance is possible. I will also add, I don't know that I have seen a good model or case study for how this works. And I think in part that might have to do with the way that things like cosmopolitan get imagined. The cosmopolitanism um, sort of relies on some version of difference among groups or among kinds of people or among these sorts of things that might work at odds with the broader goal of getting past those differences. Um, and so I'd be sort of curious to think, I mean, I would, especially if anyone has any suggestions about um, possible models or case studies to check out where this sort of thing does seem to work well. Um, but I guess in terms of both the sort of historical and critical literature that I'm familiar with, I've most often seen it working in the opposite way, that things that claim to be very inclusive actually end up being very exclusive, um, which actually is precisely how things like, how ideas like good English end up being very exclusive even when they seem like they're being inclusive. So on the one hand, anyone can speak good English if only they try hard enough, or at least that's what proponents of it will tell you. And yet often what you see is that people are more interested in policing those who are falling outside the category of good English, for example. Um, and this is a, it's actually uh, the subject of another chapter in my dissertation, which comes right before this one actually. And this gets back to the question that Ian Yen asked earlier about uh, folks who had nothing bad to say about Singlish, because that's sort of the chapter where everyone who has things bad to say about Singlish ended up. Um, so I guess it's sort of, um, that I'll stop because that's a very um, long answer already, but I would love if anyone has ideas on models or case studies in particular to check out. Yeah, Thank I, I have, uh, a, I have there a quick... Is, uh, there is a question from uh, Nasri. I'm going to invite Nasri to turn, off his, uh, turn on his video and um, um, unmute himself in a while. Uh, but before that, uh, can I turn to uh, uh, Yen Yen and ask if uh, she would like to respond? Yeah, so I, uh, so in 2018, so what happened was in 2018, PISA, you know, uh, the, the uh, performance of international students in math and literacy and so on, the test by OECD, um, that a lot of educators and a lot of countries cite as educate, kind of a test for educational achievement. In 2018, what PISA started doing was it tested countries across the world for global competence. And Singaporean kids came up kind of near the top, top or near the top, and it was kind of spoken about in the media quite a bit that Singaporean, Singaporean kids are globally competent. Um, and the categories for testing for global competence are things like whether you can put yourself in other people's shoes, whether you know another language. So, so those are the various categories. Um, I think there is a big movement globally, and especially you see that in MBA schools where uh, there's kind of a, 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 a people talking about the importance of cultural intelligence, kind of knowing the other um, and being able to step across. Um, and I, I actually think that in because of my work with my husband Colin in Singlish and in kind of Singapore culture, I do feel that without we can't truly be globally competent without having some kind of cultural confidence in our own culture and languages. Uh, we cannot be we will be will be lost culturally. We'll be lost linguistically. Um, so that's where that's where from our work with with the audience, that's what we have come to discover that we that we must. So as, as Singapore moves and become more global, we also have to build that. We, we, we can't truly be global without cultural confidence in who we are. Thanks so much. I think that that's very uh, uh, profound, Yen Yen. And I, I suppose the trick then is to develop that 
confidence again grounded in an inclusive sense of our own culture right because uh, it can so easily slip into uh, even chauvinism but uh, let's turn to Nazri uh, Barawi would you like to introduce yourself and pose your question hi uh, Josh uh, I'm Nazri and we, we know each other uh, I'm a lecturer at SUTD uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design. So my question is about uh, this very idea of a canonization of Singlish. Uh, it's not mentioned in, in the video, but I was just wondering in the materials you have encountered in this video, two videos, or in other uh, you know, encounters that you have, the data that you have, was there any contestation of the kind of Singlish that were, were being used? And if so, uh, what do you make of those uh, uh, contestations? Thanks. Uh, but uh, Nazri, uh, could you clarify canonization? Uh, do you mean, yeah. uh, because I guess English could mean a mix of English and Malay or a mix of English and Chinese. And so is that That's what right. you mean by canonization? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm also referring to uh, the process of uh, someone like Gui Li Sui, for example, who's uh, ca kind of, you know, um, giving a very uh, prescriptive view of what English should be, right? Uh, and, you know, almost canonizing it. So, so I'm not singling him out. Uh, I think there are there's this view of that, uh, but uh, but then there are also you know, English is supposed to be a kind of organic language, and I want to wonder if if it's getting fixed or is it still organic? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Um, the short answer is yes. I do have some material on this, and it's actually funny that you would mention Greeley Sui in particular because I'm presenting a paper on Friday that's comparing the treatment of Singlish in Greeley Sui's work uh, with that of Hamid Roslan in the Pars Tree Forest Fire work that uh, was shortlisted for, shortlisted, longlisted for the uh, Singapore Literature Prize. Um, and they're two very different approaches to Singlish. And I know we have spoken about this in the past um, where one is attempting to sort of produce a a relatively narrow version of what Singlish is that's very self-conscious about the selection of words from all of the different racial groups in Singapore and all of this, which, um, you know, there's a certain politics to that as well. And there's one that ends up being a lot harder to pin down, and it's a lot more sort of fluid and um, I don't know, expansive in that sense. Um, so I have that, that that I'm working on, and I would be happy to share that with you if you're interested. Um, but then there's also a way that people are contesting the idea of a sort of um, standardizing Singlish versus one that is more fluid. Um, that often in my reading of it, or at least in the conversations that I've been a part of, ends up being about all kinds of other things as well. So often this becomes a critique about um, things like class or about racialized majoritarian privilege, which sometimes gets called Chinese privilege in Singapore. Um, and so critiques over language are also critiques over other things as well, as, as you know. And I'm, I know I'm being sort of vague about that, but, but this is maybe the more general version of my answer. Uh, thanks, Josh. There's a question from uh, Timothy Lowe. I, I could read it out, but Timothy, if you'd like to uh, pose it in person, that would be a lot. Uh, warmer I guess. Uh, yeah <clears throat> I, can, I can definitely do that um sorry about that um great presentation very interesting i was kind of curious if you could talk a bit more about the i guess the actual institutional structures that also allow for belonging and exclusion so i'm thinking of you know different kinds of work visas when people come in and in particular uh, something i mentioned in the comments is that i saw recently an exhibition at the national uh, History Museum in Singapore, where they actually had this section of, on the children of Gurkhas, Gurkha guards in Singapore, and, and they feel Singaporean because they're raised here and they speak English, I'm sure. But then when they're 21 or when their uh, father or parents leave, they have to leave as well. And then th there's that too, right? And they, they don't have that actual that path to citizenship. Yes, thank you so much for this question. Um, and I think you already, even in the way that you formulated this question in the chat, you're pointing to a lot of the things that have come up in my own research. Now, I'm not particularly like an institutional or organizational sociologist or political scientist, but um, I do pay attention to the way people talk about structures of things like pathways to cit citizenship. Or um, another thing that comes up a lot in the interviews that I've done are things like the inclusion of racial categories on ICs, for example, uh, where it's not necessarily a particularly 
powerful form of institutionalization, but it is a very visible one that then makes it uh, subject to people's awareness in different ways. Um, I definitely would love to, I've seen some media circulating about the, uh, about the Gurkhas who were forced to leave Singapore and all of the controversy surrounding that, but um, I would love to check out more about this National History Museum exhibit. But um, I'm not sure if that's addressing your question, but I really appreciate this, this comment and the, the question as well. Thank you. Um, is there, um, I'm, I'm just going back to uh, Yen Yen's uh, uh, remarks earlier, uh, Josh was able to address a couple of them. Is there uh, another from your remarks that you would like to, uh, him to revisit in, in closing? Um, I wanted to ask Josh, actually, there was one moment where you talked about uh, being unable or inability or not good enough in languages is a, a Singaporean trait for that you found, like in 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 right, uh, something about the inability to speak both English and Chinese. Could you say more about that? And you didn't expand expand on it. And I was curious about what you thought about that. And I was also reminded by, famously, who's the who's the billionaire billionaire immigrant to Singapore who got his daughter to speak uh, Chinese, and then he famously did an interview. What's his name? Oh my God, the uh, uh, who, uh, who, who got his, who moved to, immigrated to Singapore so that his daughters could learn Chinese. Um, and then he did an inter interview um, and then he said, oh, Singaporeans are bad in English and, and, and Mandarin and Chinese, are bad in English and bad in Chinese. And it reminded me of that. Uh, I wonder if Josh could say more about uh, what you were thinking. Yeah, thank you for this. I will keep this as quick as possible since we're down to the final minute, but um, this is the subject of another chapter in my thesis where I'm talking about forms of linguistic insecurity, uh, which you talked about as well in your, in your question, or I guess it was a comment earlier about how you need to have confidence before you can have competence. And there is a sort of way that I have seen a lot of um, strategies for both performing your own lack of confidence, but also for sort of enforcing a lack of confidence by showing how many uh, errors someone is making, where I, I looked a lot at um, language classrooms, and in particular, some classes that are taught by the uh, British Council in Singapore to teach Singaporeans good English. And a lot of how those sorts of classes, and again, this is no shade toward the British Council, but a lot of how there's a sort of implicit structure built up in these classes is revealing the mistakes that people didn't know that they were making, which doesn't necessarily make them better able to avoid doing these things in the future, it more becomes a site or a source of insecurity. Um, so this was the sort of comment that I had made in this paper in passing, and I think I just sort of said I talk about this in another chapter, um, but I'd be happy to discuss that with you further or even send you the other chapters so you can uh, take a look at it if you're interested. Granted, you've already done a lot of work for commenting on my, on my research already, so thank you. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, in a way, you know, I, I do sympathize with yourself as well as other, uh, you know, young scholars doing extremely meaningful work because, uh, you know, it kind of backfires because we sort of overburden you with all our own uh, social needs and anxieties. And I think today's is, uh, your, your uh, research is a good example of that. I mean, uh, realistically, there is only so much uh, any scholar can, can do to, to help us uh, make sense of, um, uh, the, of, of things like language and, and, and race and nationalism and belonging and so on. Uh, but, you know, the, these anxieties and these yearnings that, that we have in the audience are so great that, you know, we, uh, we're demanding more from you, right? <laughs> we, want, we want you to tell us, you know, what does it mean to have a good life and a good society, which are far bigger than any one scholar, let alone, uh, you know, a dissertation can accomplish. And, and you know, the, the question of confidence that uh, uh, Yen Yen brought up is echoed by um, someone on, uh, in, in our audience, who I won't uh, get to just because we're out of time, but, you know, what one of the um, problems problems that he correctly raises is that, you know, how, how can we develop confidence when our own 
uh, what makes us Singaporean is so um, uh, is so hybrid, right? And uh, uh, are we expecting Chinese Singaporeans to be uh, to immerse themselves in Chinese language and culture? And same for Indians and Malays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, obviously, there there are uh, there's a downside to that if we're going to define our confidence in terms of. Uh, um, mastery of our ancestral cultures and, and uh, how, so then how do we develop confidence out of uh, what has been a relatively short history uh, and, and these are of course uh, questions that are well outside the scope of, <laughs> of your research or any any individual research but I, I hope you you what you have gathered today uh, Josh is the uh, is a strong sense that your work is, is meaningful that it will help us uh, uh, make sense of our condition uh, you know, even if you're not going to tell us how to, if you can't tell us how to live our lives, for which I guess uh, we need to consult uh, a religion and, <laughs> and therapists. <laughs> but uh, I hope you have found this uh, as, as rewarding as we have in the audience. Um, I want to thank uh, Josh for a great presentation. Uh, thank uh, Yen Yen for extremely uh, uh, perceptive and valuable pointers and questions. Uh, Corey for helping in, in the background and all of you who have uh, tuned in. Uh, you, you've uh, kept our tradition going of uh, you know, showcasing some great uh, research on Singapore. So thanks again, uh, Josh, and uh, uh, I'll say goodbye till next time. Thank you. <laughs>